Hello and welcome to Future Casting with Utah State. I'm Elizabeth Cantwell. I'm the president of USU and the host of this podcast. Today, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Susan Madsen, the Karen Haight Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in USU's John M. Huntsman School of Business. She's also the founding director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, leading a bolder way forward, a statewide social change movement. So we'll be talking about her books. We'll also be talking about the Utah Women in Leadership Project. Welcome, Susan. It's so good to be here. Nice to meet you. So let's get started. I mean, I have a bunch of questions for you, but I'm actually really interested in having you just give our audience just a sense, you know, in the time frame we have of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, because I think that's kind of the cup that, that holds a lot of, you know, the other things I'd love to bring to the, Absolutely. To the podcast. Absolutely. I actually started the Utah Women in Leadership project in 2009. So it's been, you know, 15 years. And still lots of work to do, and, I would say. And there's say. still lots of work to yeah. do. But I started it, and it was supposed to be a one-year project. The commissioner of higher education had asked me to do some research on why more women in Utah were not going to and completing mm. college. And that was in 2009. And then I said, okay, two years. And then after two years of doing research around the state, people started asking me for data on other topics of women. Um, the women in leadership and different roles. And so I started that and it's continued to go and it's gotten uh, grown based on really the needs of Utah. So our mission is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. And uh, I moved the project from Utah Valley University to Utah State University about three and a half years ago. And so that mission, again, to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women, we do that in three ways. Our biggest thing that we're known for is that we do research. We do yes. relevant, trustworthy research, yes. lots of research. We publish it in different formats. Number two, we then create resources. So some people just don't read long documents and research, but we do curriculum. We do research-based uh, podcasts and all of those kinds of things. And then third, we create and, and do events and gatherings and convenings. And to really inspire, educate people towards change. And that's my focus. That was part of my doctoral work is mm. organization development and change. And I've been studying societal change for years. And we need changes here in the state of Utah. Can I ask you if it's even possible to do a tiny bit of distinguishing the situation, if you will, in Utah versus other states in the U.S. that have been studied that have data about them? Because I do think we have some unique challenges. We do. We do. And I have studied the religious element for years. Mm -hmm. And I happen to be a very strong, active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But our presence in this religion, and, and, and we're not alone. There are other states that are religious and conservative are, yes. like we are. But you see the same things. And by the way, other countries. Yes. So there's been research to look at more religious societies, more conservative societies and what differs us from other states. And there's definitely, we tend to, let me just give you an example. For instance, everybody pretty much has a pay gap on gender. But when you look at more religious societies, that pay gap is wider. Uh, many of the issues we talk about, women's businesses and women's leadership roles and women in politics, you see less women in politics in more religious and conservative societies. So maybe this is too much to, to no, but there is a piece that I think is really critical here. And that is when there's a big distinction between what women should do, quote should, and what men should do, whatever culture that might be in, you tend to see some of the same issues. And so in our culture, we tend to say women should do these kinds of things that men should do. And that's when you see some of the power dynamics, you know, that men have significantly more power than women in the, in the public space. Yes. I do think those social climates that you're discussing, women also make different choices. Absolutely. Um, but so let's talk for a minute, if you could sort of give us an introduction to your book series, Women in Leadership in Higher Education. This is the world we are in. Yes. I mean, yes. I think it's a great sort of microcosm in some ways, but I would say that because I live in it and, yes. I, and I work in it Absolutely. and I'm a leader in it. I'm really interested in having our listeners understand what we mean by social change. 
Hmm. And what we mean by the sort of social constructs that that are that we're talking about here. First one, I've actually published now nine books, but two of them were specifically on women in higher education settings. My first one was I interviewed some of the top women higher education presidents in the country on their lifetime journey yeah. of developing leadership. And my second one, it was an edited book on women in higher education with many chapters from different researchers around. And so it's, um, though both of those are older books, but I've had such an interest in those topics specifically around women and leadership in higher education. Most of the time, women and men do lead differently. We have differences in our brains, differences in our styles, and, um, and, and that's important to, you know, consider and look at. But let me just tell you, like, has anything changed in the last 10 or 20 years since I've been starting on this? Uh, I do think we are seeing more women in leadership roles. Of course, in Utah, we lag in, in women's president. Most, I'll tell you, I've had a lot of people in the state of Utah, though, because they see more women at the presidential level. And we have quite a few. I mean, it's shifting all mm-hmm. the time. We're losing one in the next little while, which um, is, is sad because Denise Huffdeland is a good friend of mine. But we have seen some shifts. But the one thing I want to say is sometimes when we see a woman at the top, we assume all of the issues are resolved. But when we dig down into the dean level and other levels, um, we see a big disparity. In fact, in the state of Utah, you will see more women, and and not just in our state, you will see more women as lecturers, Mm -hmm. you'll see more women as assistant professors, but it just drops off associate professor and then full professor, especially, can I say, in STEM areas, non-traditional areas. And, you uh, have a lot of those Susan on your campus. Susan may be mentioning that because, well, we have a lot, and, and, and I'm an engineer. Yes. Um, and, and came up at a time when there were really uh, just so few yeah. women in engineering, let alone in leadership roles. I get asked by students a lot about being a woman in leadership, and hmm. and I, I usually answer through my, my sort of personal because I'm not a, a scholar of women in higher education. So I don't answer from a scholarly perspective. But I get, so I'm going to glean a lot of things from you. I find And one that, of my students, can I just say, yeah. interviewed you. Th- oh, okay. So thank yeah, you. Yeah, she was lovely. She was lovely. I know exactly who you're talking about. So one of the things I said to her, though, was, you know, there is an enormous body now of scholarship about how in the aggregate or in the average, the brains of women and the brains of men sort of process information. And I said, I think women are remarkably good uh, higher ed presidents now because the nature of the position is so complex and the complexity has increased radically in the last 10 years. Our brains are well suited to amalgamate lots of different vectors of information and vectors of decision making. That That is so true. What we know from MRIs and other kinds of research, yeah. there's deep, I'm not a scientist in that area, but what we know is that men typically, you know, process separately on the right and left sides of the brain. And when you look at the activity in the brain, women's brains are going across both of both right the right left. and yes. <laughs> all the time, so much more than men. And so it's interesting to think back on, you know, early, early days, uh, you know, the hunters and gatherers. I mean, men and, and testosterone. Honestly, I've studied hormones and some different things in the past. You know, their testosterone rises. They run and kill the buffaloes and bring the food. And women are like, let's multitask. Let's right. get the children. Let's protect the children. Let's make sure we have snacks <laughs> in, the, in the cave. I carried a purse car. I called it because I have three boys uh, for decades. I always had a little car in my purse. Isn't that fun? While I was out lecturing and See, all the I other used things. to have a little car for church. So <laughs> there you go. You have to, you do multitask. Yeah. And so biologically, it's, it's very fascinating. And when you shift to like today, it's fascinating to look at what men and women do differently and sometimes similarly. What we know from the research is that when women walk into a room, they actually scan the room mm. differently than men. 
And they look for different things. They look for body language and nonverbals and all kinds of things and, and then make their choices. And men typically, not all women are the same, not all men are the same, but men will just like focus on one thing and then go for the seat they want. And we're like, okay, should I sit here or should I sit over there? Or am I wanted at this table? Or do I sit in the background? <laughs> and sometimes to our disadvantage, because if we are not conscious of things and we've been socialized by what we see we're going to sit in the back we're going to sit on the side instead of at the table taking up space even the way we sit is gendered isn't that interesting it's it's very interesting and i having taken pretty much every uh, every vehicle available for sort of personality assessment and like have teams you? and you know all the all the all the things that Strength are out finder, there. Strengths finder, have yeah, you done that? All one? that oh. I am statistically out on the edge for women. <laughs> More on the sort of I'm going to find my seat. I'm going to sit at the table. I'm going to tell people what. Well, to do. I was raised with six brothers and no <laughs> sisters, so I'm so, yeah. and I and I was an athlete. Which may, there's fascinating Very research about yeah. athletes. Do you know that like ninety? What what is it today? Ninety two percent of female Fortune 500,000, Fortune 500, um, 1,000 companies were athletes in high school or college. I didn't, I don't know. but it, that sort of yeah, discipline to a goal, mm, um, yeah. especially the way we do with with athletes now, which is you start them when they're kind of five yes. or six years old. I coached. So, <laughs> so let's, let's continue down that path. I'd really like to spend a fair amount of time talking about a bolder way forward would, and to have you tell that. us what that is and really, I will I will play the role of the neophyte kind of, because I think for my community, this will be a really important thing to hear about. Yeah, thank you. I love the question. So um, I've been doing this work on women in leadership in the state, but broadened it. I mean, women in leadership is my academic study yeah. area. But I broaden that because what I realized is that so many things impact women in leadership from the basics of getting an education, finishing high school, going to college, getting, I mean, degrees in college lead to more more leadership. But then I also started and continued to to look at things like domestic violence and sexual assault and entrepreneurship and so forth. Anyway, we published in so many of these areas. But in 2022, right at the end, I read a book. I, I don't have too much time to read unless I'm on flights. And I love flights for so reading. I am so with you. I am so with you. <laughs> so I read a book called, and I've studied societal change for decades, but I read this book called How Change Happens, Why Some Social Movements Succeed mm. While Others Do Not. By the time, and I two flights to Costa Rica, I did some speaking at Congress down there, actually, two flights back. By the time I landed, I said, we've got to do something new. And in 2022, I really was unsettled thinking about, we're doing so much research, we're doing so much stuff. Utah's having conferences, everybody's doing so much stuff, but the needle's not moving. Yeah. We're still seeing so many issues around the pay gap, around the violence issues against girls and women in the state, that I said, we've got to do something different. So that had been on mm-hmm. my mind, read this book, and then by the time I landed, really, and I'm a religious, spiritual person, the bolder way forward came, things came, maybe it's because mm-hmm. I'm close to the heavens, or maybe I'm just locked in a seat, and I have to reflect and meditate, yeah. but I loved that. And so basically, I, my journal was full of notes, and the, the premise really is, and I've studied in my doctoral work and through the years, systems thinking. So we're doing lots of parts and pieces in this state. There's conferences, there's parts all over, but we're not moving the needle. And the research that was presented in this book, and and I've read it in other places, is that the key is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That you can do pieces and parts, but but if you unite in, Mm. in various ways, be strategic, move together, where are the gaps? What hasn't been done? Appreciate and lift everybody else's efforts too that are really, you know, have are, are based on good research, are based on good theory, that everybody can lift each other in unique ways. And so I know that sounds like 
pie in the sky to some people. But in general, um, we have the appetite to do this right now. We have the appetite. So what the book talked about were efforts like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, very successful. Um, mar- gay marriage was very successful. Yes. Um, National Rifle Association. The one I remember with my age is when everybody used to smoke. Not everybody, but and then that smoking. So and then compare them against or with those that even had a lot of money that just didn't move the needle. What was that difference? And it was that systems thinking. It was bringing in the partners, bringing in everybody doing things and then shifting. And we call it a wheel of change. Mm. Instead of moving the needle, let's move this wheel up this hill that's been really hard for girls and women in the state of Utah. Let's move the wheel up the hill and really make a difference. So these movements had really only taken one thing, one big thing, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. But by the time I landed and really, you know, thought through it, it's like we can't take one piece and just have that for seven years make a difference. And by the way, I forgot a a really important piece. One of the things that really had me reflect is, you know, I had done work at the United Nations for years in European Union, And we look at trajectories, like how long would it take us to get to this point with parity between men and women? And for the first time, I brought it back to Utah at the rate we're Mm. moving. And and what it came to me is it's three to four decades to make any notable progress if we keep doing things the way we've been doing them. Even with stuff happening, to me, that's unacceptable. The violence rates, the different issues that we have. And so to me, it's... This movement, the Boulder Way Forward, is a seven-year. So we started in 2023, and 2030 is where we're going, and we want to shift what would take four decades in seven years. And uh, But we can't do that alone. You know, us, USU, we can't do that alone. It's bringing state government, nonprofits, stay-at-home moms, families, uh, local government, businesses together to say, no, this is the time. Utah's the place for a bolder way forward. So I'm going to ask you sort of uh, a question that has just come to me, because I've been observing as a, you know, a university administrator here, something that distinguishes, and I've been, I've had a hard time articulating it, so I'm going to try it out on you, (laughs) that distinguishes Utah to me, and it probably comes from both the predominant religion and the large number of people who are just religious generally, whether yeah. it's uh, whether it's LDS or, I mean, it really is a spiritual state. Yeah. Um, we invest a lot in the principle of redemption. Mm-hmm. And yet, so to come back over to either sexual violence or, or aspects of the way that, uh, what the data says about women and girls in Utah, th- those two things have to come together exactly. in a way that that works. And I'm not sure. I mean, I think that has to be part of the system thinking. It has Because to. I haven't seen it integrated. Absolutely. It surprises some people when they hear, and I love living in Utah, and yeah, I love I being a woman. And, and, and there are great things about Utah, but there are things that are amiss. I'm just going to be frank. I'm a frank person and honest candid. There are things that are amiss. And as we have dug in, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about this through the years, because as I said, I'm, I'm both spiritual and religious, is what is different. Because what we know is right now, we are ninth worst in terms of sexual assault and rape. Ninth worst state. Mm. Alaska's the worst. This is not something one aspires to. No, and we don't want to brag about that. We're slightly above the nation, which is terrible on in domestic violence. I mean, one in three women and one in five, one in six men. Um, but one in three women will do that. On child sexual abuse, one in seven kids in this mm. state will be sexually abused. Mm. And I, that's unacceptable to me. Yes. Can I just say that? That yes. is unacceptable. People sometimes have, have, that surprises them. They're like, what? Like we are, and, and more and more people are understanding this. But what I have to teach people is that when you are in a society, which I love in some ways, in many ways, where there is a separation in power between men and women, and there is a distinct difference between 
what is acceptable through or has been socialized on what men do and what women do. And anytime men, women don't make any money, can I just say that? Mm. You have less power. You typically stay in domestic violence. But anytime you do that, there's there's often a, an abuse of power. And so men are seen as more powerful than women. And we can say all day long, I'm being blunt here, that um, we appreciate women. There's a bit, lot of what's called benevolent sexism in our state. Not hostile, but benevolent sexism. And so when you're in a society that has this, we have to be so much more vigilant to say, yes, I, I mean, we love our religion, but we there's this edge that you have to be aware of to change the violence. Mm. So more, in fact, there's a book that's fairly recent out from someone, um, a professor from Harvard Divinity School on world Christianity and women. And she's got a whole chapter on Christianity and violence against women. Can I just put that mm. out there? So to change, which we have to do, this, can I just say, uh, again, I've said I'm religious. This is not acceptable to God. I'm just going to be clear. And, I and think we have to change. That is something we have to speak to openly. frequently. Openly. O- openly. Yes. And that is, and we're not alone in this. Yes. We're not the only state. But when you hide, when you silence, when you, and that's what we've done, not just Utah, but other states, we don't talk about uncomfortable things. We don't like that, right? A lot of women don't like that in a lot of ways. It seems to be culturally very Utah as well. Yeah, but unless we break the silence, I've been writing a lot on this, breaking the silence about these violence issues and some other issues as well, because we know that When we get more women in our political process, including higher percentages of women in our state legislature, that allocations and policy change. Those states with more female Mm. legislators allocate more money to, do you want to guess, K through 12, Mm. health, healthcare, and social programs like helping survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and so forth. Do you know that our legislature has never given any money to prevention of sexual assault and rape? Prevention. We don't have any prevention funding. So, But states who have more women in their state legislature do give those kinds of things. So I'm, so even though I'm talking about one issue, I, the other one about making solutions is to get more women in positions of influence and I can I just say power even though that makes women uncomfortable in (laughs) positions like yours but in positions like being a mayor or a city council or state legislature or governor we have a lieutenant governor that's a good friend of mine um, and that's making a difference right there not all women are the same though I have to say I have two different sorts of questions in my mind so let's go to like you were just starting to talk about things that I think about as measures of or signals, signs that that we're getting a little more there, more mm-hmm. women in elected positions. We're slightly, we're seeing some slight increases. But we want to see more. What are the other ways that we can look to that we're getting more successful? Certainly, good question. Certainly, sexual violence statistics decrease. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So in the bolder way forward, you know, I talked about this wheel, a wheel of change. We actually have 18 spokes. So I started saying before that that some of the movements we've looked at have one main focus. And when I was like, how do we move? I've been connecting with so many areas and I'm like, we've got to shift together. So to answer your question, the issues, the three issues I brought up are all three. Those are three of 18 what mm. we're calling spokes in yeah. the wheel. So child sexual abuse, domestic violence, sexual assault, all critical and important, along with a couple of others that we have in in one of our categories. The others are homelessness and, and poverty. Uh, so homelessness, uh, that was sort of my, my That's mind over there. really uh, automatically, I think, goes to an, another intractable, systemic, yes. misunderstood. And we're actually better... And- on, on those than most other states. We're number two, well, some, some rank is at number two, on poverty, unless you are a woman that's a single mother yes. or over, over a certain age. Um, but also 
sexual harassment and domestic and sexual harassment and gender based discrimination. So those are some. Higher education attainment is another one. Mm-hmm. We have groups, leaders, organizations involved in all of these. Finances is important. Women in finance, that's that's critical, as well as some K through twelve initiatives. The workplace has seven of our spokes. And child care, mm-hmm. can I just say yes, that? You can. That and, is yes. that's huge in Utah, but You've, I'm sure, read and and talked about this in Arizona when you were. I mean, it's a problem every place. Quality, accessible childcare, and it's something that we, every institution of higher education that I've been at has is struggling. It's a massive challenge because of for for students for and employees, students right? And employees, both of which are and and on our campus are equally important. We have a huge number of parent undergraduate yeah. students more than any more state, than any probably. state and they are incredibly valuable members of our community and we we fail to deliver for a lot of rational reasons the level of child care that that yeah. we would like to have here um, and it is complicated it, it's it's very complicated other ones are the pay gap in that workforce yeah. spoke entrepreneurship well, organizational then, strategies and workplace let's culture. talk about entrepreneurship for a minute yeah. because that's an area that I am very familiar with yeah. and um, it is historically I mean looking at the data there are shamefully few women involved in things like startups in you know components of the innovation ecosystem, including the financial component, are really engaged in STEM. Can I say that's another one of our spokes is STEM fields. Mm -hmm. So that's, you're passionate about that, that area for sure. You can say that. And my reading, it is an area I know just a little bit about is women and girls in the U.S. are in a parity position or even much stronger than boys in, uh, in grades K through six, and it still to this day falls off like a cliff. Well, puberty um, studied that in girls, and what's mm. so hard and sad in on many fronts is that the age of puberty for girls has decreased, and in fact, seven. Can you imagine? I can't, seven but, to it mm. used to be ten to fourteen, and now it's like seven to I don't know what the top is, but that just means so much. In fact, the research on confidence. That boys and girls are confident and at the same level until puberty. And then most girls never catch up at that. So there's some complex things in terms of, complex. of not just genetics and biology, but socialization. Yes. But we have right now this year the biggest gap in math scores in the whole nation between boys and girls in eighth grade. Mm. Now, I want you listeners to think about that because sometimes people dismiss that. Your confidence with math, you would know this more than me, <laughs> goes into your decisions in high school, on what courses, college, all the way. And the amount of times I have heard here, I'm just not good at math. Oh, that's socialization. So, um, that's not genetics. It isn't genetics. It's socialization. There, for those of you listening, there is no such thing. It's a muscle that you use. You exercise it or not. But there is no such thing as I'm just not good at math. Even for those of you that are math dyslexic, and that's a, a number dyslexic yeah. is a real thing, uh, there is no such thing as I'm just not good at math. Now, before I forget, I want to give you one more stat in terms of Utah, we've caught up in a lot of ways and are slightly girls or young women in bachelor's degree attainment. We're slightly above men. And we don't necessarily want that. We want boys and young men and men and, you know, and women to all get more degrees, right? But um, we have the biggest gap in the nation significantly. Nobody's even close in the graduate degree attainment before yes. between men and women yes. in the state. I, that doesn't um, surprise me. Uh, the other thing we are seeing, and I always, because I have so many boys, <laughs> is we're seeing, we are seeing, uh, even here in Utah, the um, percentage of, of girls and boys, women and men in our undergraduate programs is shifting really quickly to more women than men. And we need men, too. Absolutely. However, that also means that we are graduating less STEM majors. Oh, yes, that's true. So it's a really bad combination. It's bad for men um, who should be getting those degrees. Yeah. Um, It's bad for all of us in that we're socially, we're not delivering into the workplace the STEM majors. And we're high on STEM needs. We are very high in the state of Utah, very high. 
We have a lot of great jobs. It's awesome, yeah. But we need to make sure, I mean, people are asking me all the time, why why don't more girls go into STEM? And I'm like, there is socialization that happens that parents and influencers of all kinds at young ages, they're maybe not saying that, but there's messages that happen. So uh, and trying to figure out how to dig into those. And, and there's subtle things by parents a lot. But there's also, I mean, I, I also have two girls. And so the influence of... So how many kids do you have five, total? I have five kids. I did not know that. Yeah. yeah. The influence of social media, which is a term oh, meaning... Yes. that What I'm talking about really is the uh, rather, and it, it's true for boys as well as girls, obsessive focus yes. on bodies and more for girls and though body image yeah. and is destructive frankly, it's it's, it, it's really hard to watch because it is so obviously destructive yeah the research we've had some events brought in specialists um and have them on our website by the way ut utwomen.org gets you over to the mm. utah women in leadership yeah. project and and the complexity in and it crosses over into another spoke that we have and that's called health across a lifespan and one of the subspokes is mental health. Oh my gosh! Here's another. That's, I mean, that's huge. The other we one. could. It's, we it's could. such an intractable systemic problem that probably has 25 spokes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would love to sit down with you that's and whiteboard whole... what are those spokes? Yeah. yeah. And mental health, uh, homelessness. These. Yeah, we have 18, but our health across the lifespan, which, by the way, are anchored by Intermountain Health. Mm-hmm. And uh, University of Utah Health and Regents Blue Cross Blue yeah. Shields is a major partner in this, and we're pulling in all of the others. These are massive things that that the healthcare industry is coming right to the Boulder Way Forward to be part of this because of how important it is. But each of these is massive, and what we're talking about is again to go away from the pieces and parts. People still need to do their pieces and parts, but can we do, quote, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts to be able to shift everything together? Um, and that's, we have to do something. Not We're not the only state with mental health issues. Everybody's got them in the world right now. But we see some, some that we're worse in some ways. And mental health, we, we have had a history in the state of Utah with more antidepressants, mm. with more um, prescription, you know, abuse, prescription drug abuse, some uh, some other things that are disturbing. And I will tell you that body image issues, we're high on com- cosmetic surgery, we're high on things that relate to body image. And so there's some interesting messages. I'm Like we know in, in my religion, I'm taught I am a daughter of heavenly parents Yet, in this internal worth is the most important, yet there's this external. I don't have all the answers, can I just say? But we just have to have our daughter. I have a daughter. I have three granddaughters. And I will tell you, I think about them every day. And I want the state to be better for my daughter Mm. and for my granddaughters and for the other people I love that are boys and girls, men and women, right? Because when we lift and strengthen girls and women, it's not scarcity. It means that we're lifting our boys and our families. And that's critical. The boys and men do reflect that. And there's work to do there too. Sometimes people say to me, what are you doing for boys and men? I'm like, I'm called to do the work for girls and women. And I support and would love more work on boys and men because you're not going to get the violence rates down. You're not going to get the opportunities up unless we work with Men to become male allies and, and boys so that they understand these things. It's, it's not just, I mean, I actually think we measure the thriving. What are the th- measures of men actually thriving? Not the appearance mm. of uh, power, power, for instance, yeah. but literally mentally thriving. Because I think that's, I mean, that's what I think about for, for my boys and our students. Yeah. We get, we have so many different ways of knowing that as time goes on, the students that we are getting fresh out of high school in particular, Mm. um, so for instance, no mission, fresh out of high school, are less and less mentally ready Mm. for the 
for the education and the experience that we offer. There's at so USU. much noise it's, yes. in growing up these days. I mean, the video games, everything is impacting boys in really disturbing ways, too. But that noise, and parents are at a loss in a lot of ways. And that's why it's so important to not just believe that we have all the answers but we seek like at you in usu extension there's so many resources about healthy relationships Absolutely. and raising kids because that's what people we ask our communities what do you need our rural communities in yes. particular that is what they ask us for it's more help in that area yeah, uh, so many. You and I are just going all over the place. Yes, well, that's what uh, but happens I love with it. Me. <laughs> that's no, what happens with I me. love it. What you know, back to the bolder way forward. Yeah. You you brought up entrepreneurship. Let me close the loop yeah. on that. We actually have mixed things in Utah about women and entrepreneurship. Some we rank high. The one that Wallet Hub uses actually, we we're like forty six, mm. and they. So we have a lot of opportunities for businesses and entrepreneurship for women, yet we're very low on women businesses that they have another employee other than themselves. Yes. So I wanted to co close the loop on so that. So interesting. Yeah. So and we have less, you know, lots of businesses with very low revenue, yet starting businesses there's so much help in fact in extension too is the sbdc yes so many good resources there that most people don't even know about check out usu extension and also the utah women and leadership project but um but let's go back um if you don't mind to to let me just put a couple of of those 18 spokes in the boulder way forward yeah. there were just a couple more that i wanted to highlight that big health across the lifespan but i don't want to forget to mention that one of our spokes is home and family. Mm -hmm. That is so Huge. critical because the social media, all of these, the mental health, there's all kinds of things for home and family. And we're not just talking about getting women into the workforce. Yes, they need to do that. They want to do that. Let's support. Yet women choosing to stay at home and raising kids is such a value. Hugely I did valuable. that for so many years. Um, and so that is important. And again, and again you know, getting more women engaged in political, right now that's important, political offices, boards and commissions in their communities, also just using their voices. Don't you think that's do. um, like understanding that their voice matters? I meet girls and women all the time who do not believe that their role is to use their voice and, and be an advocate. And I'm saying that is the role of every mother, of it every is. individual to let's get that confidence, lean in, use their voice. That's how we protect home and family. That's how we, you can tell I'm passionate about these things, right? I could go on and on. But I think that's also a large part of how we provide the seeds in children for even you know moving through some of these social change scenarios that you've talked about even having the mental capacity to do that is to see it in their mom with whom they spend oh, maybe yes. most of their time and that's important for young women to see and, and for young men. young men both need to see that the research is very clear that the more educated mothers you have and i love it when Moms come back to school. I love that. I'm like, welcome, welcome. Yeah. But the more they, the more their sons and their daughters are more likely to go to college and graduate. And and I just can't help myself to make a quick pitch that um, no matter what the people say in Utah, it is still critically important to go yes. get post secondary education. Yes. And if you get certificates, go to an associate next, and then you can move into that bachelor's. And it's not or. You can be a mom and be in school part-time for a graduate degree. You can, and you can get that graduate degree or that even that AA degree yes. at any point in your life. Yeah. Um, and, even and one class at a time. We completely welcome that. And I all the data says that even if you have, have been and remain either a stay-at-home mom or a woman who raises your own family and then helps raise your children's families, if you have some form of degree, 
those children and grandchildren will be economically better off, even if you never go into the workplace yourself. And it's really good data. I mean, it is lots and lots and lots of data points. And I have some good reports out there that as I started really that conversation a lot in the state of Utah, but not just economic, but the research on people who vote and get engaged in the community, the more education, the more you do that. Parenting benefits and nutrition and um, but smarter. We're all smarter the more we learn. And when I was a stay at home mom, you, I was still making economic, financial Always. decisions. There's so much work for, you know, your brain when you're a mom. And I, I will, I will maybe end us by sort of going down the line of what you, something you just mentioned, which is that engagement in the sort of the political life of the state, becoming a viable citizen, knowing enough about the issues. And voting. That's more and um, more important. Comes as much from your home life mm, yes. as it does from what you, in fact, probably more yeah. than what you learn in college or your peers once you get into your 20s is really what you see happening at the dinner table yeah. in your, in the home in which you are raised, which is so, so vitally important. Um, Can for, I just say in my gets first us women book, elected. <laughs> in my in my absolutely, yeah. But in my first book, there is information about the dinner table conversation and how yes. critical that yes. was. After I did this research, I said I have four children. I'm like, come to the dinner right. table. We are having dinner my, together. <laughs> my kids were like, "What's wrong with mom?" I'm like, I need to cook more. <laughs> It's it's fun yeah. and and our impact as women on our children and on other people's children and and men have that impact too, but our daughters and sons and neighbors and students need to see men and women in our classrooms teaching. They need to see researchers who are men and women. They need to see political officials who are men and women. That is just important. There's so much research on the benefits for society and homes and workplaces when men and women are are both in the conversation of more equal numbers. Here, here. I love it. Can I just say Please. before we, but I want to make sure if people are listening in that they know how to get involved with the Boulder Way Yes, Forward. thank you very much. Thank you. Because that, right now we have a couple thousand people already engaged, but to really shift things in home and family, in workplaces, in society, whatever it might be of all these spokes I've been talking about, we will need tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of Utahns to engage uh, we can't get violence down unless every home knows this. So how do you do a bolderwayforward.org is Thank the you. easy way to get that. And you can look around and watch a 15-minute video that I do. Look at what's happening all in that. And I'll tell you, welcome in. Whether you're a student, whether you're a faculty or staff or community member, welcome. And, and we have a coalition here in Cache County for A Bolder Way Forward. And just a, a bolder way forward yeah. org. I, I also encourage everybody listening to take a look. And even if women and girls are not your special thing, there are so many ways that this work um, can impact the what feel like intractable problems to yeah. us. It is a bolder way. It is a way forward. So thank you. We've been talking to Dr. Susan Madsen about uh, Utah Women and Girls Leadership Project and a bolder way forward. And thank you, Susan, for uh, uh, finding some time for me. Thank you so much for the invitation. Special thanks to Susan Madsen for joining us on Future Casting with Utah State. And thank you to the planners who made this week's episode possible. Thank you for joining us in Future Casting with Utah State. Future Casting is a production of Utah Public Radio and Utah State University sponsored by the Office of the President. Our producer is Hannah Castro with the help from the Utah State's Marketing and Communications team. And the theme music was produced by Justin Warnick. You can listen to Future Casting at upr.org or wherever you get your podcasts.